In 2009, specifically January 15th, in New York City, it was very cold. It was snowy. And you may recall the story back on January 15th, 2009, of Captain Chelsea Sullenberger, captain of U.S. Airways Flight 1549, taking off out of LaGuardia. And they just got lift off. They're going out of the city and they hit a flock of geese. And something unprecedented happened. It shut down both the engines of this large Airbus. Over 150 people on board. They're going over the Hudson. And remember, it became the, he became the hero of the Hudson. They landed safely. But what I want you to do is, is be there. Be there with them for just a minute. In just a minute. Uh, heal. Um, be there for just a minute. Um, and experience, feel the stress and what it may have been like to be in that cockpit. Here's a little clip from the movie Sully. It's runway four. I don't think we can make any runway. Uh, what about over to our right? Anything in New Jersey, maybe Teterboro? Okay, yeah, off your right side is Teterboro Airport. A LaGuardia departure, got emergency inbound. This is Teterboro South, go ahead. Uh, Cactus 1549 of the GW Bridge. Needs to go to the airport right now. Cactus, do you need assistance? Yes, bird strike. Can Let's I get see. him in for runway one? Go to Teterboro. Obstacle, obstacle. Obstacle, obstacle. Pull up. Clear of conflict. No relight up for 30 seconds in your master one and two. Confirm off. Off. Wait 30 seconds. Too low terrain. Too low terrain. Too low terrain. Too low terrain. This is the captain. Brace for impact. 500. Yeah, can you feel the stress? Obstacle, obstacle, too low, terrain, brace for impact. And what I want to suggest to you is that Captain Sullenberger um, landed that plane safely, not primarily because of his skill, not primarily because of his 40 years of aviation experience. Do you know why he landed that plane safely? Because he was able to keep in perspective and not be overtaken by the emotions of the moment. The voices coming at him from the tower saying, you can land over here. Uh, the, the cockpit, the obstacle, obstacle, terrain, terrain, brace for impact. He was able to stay focused and not be overwhelmed. That is what allowed him to access his skill, access all of his experience. And isn't that what we want when we hit those obstacles in life? Because it may not be the George Washington Bridge, but you hit something. It, it, stuff comes up and it gets really close to home, doesn't it? How do we live with that kind of balance and stability and resilience. I call it stress resilience. And here's my definition for stress resilience. Stress resilience is making clear-headed, healthy decisions amidst inner and outer stressors. Healthy decisions. We make decisions, but they're often controlled by the stress that we encounter. And that was exactly what Sully was modeling for us. The ability to filter through all that and to access what's healthy. And everyone benefited as a result, right? So we're doing that. We're looking at this and this way of looking at ourselves and how it impacts others through this series. And many of you have been here along the way. This series called Inside Out, how emotions limit or liberate spiritual growth. And we're making that connection. Because if there's anything that can limit or liberate us emotionally, it is stress, right? Right? It elicits emotions that can throw us off or can become an opportunity for us to manage ourselves better and therefore to manage our relationships better. And that's really what emotional intelligence is all about. Managing yourself inwardly, not being controlled by your emotions, and managing the emotions of those around you to be able to manage the relationships. 
Now, the idea of stress, as we're talking about it today, it, it should be said that stress is really neutral. It's not a bad thing because we know that if you go to the, to the gym and you work out uh, and you pump iron, you become a lot like Kevin McDonald. Uh, he's modeling that for us right now. Um, you, you do, you do become, seriously. So stress is, is an opportunity for growth. It's neutral, but it can also become an opportunity to run into some hazards and to go down. Um, stress is a good thing. God created us with stress to be resilient in it. Do you know what, do you know how you live a life without stress? We all say we'd like to have a, a, a stress-free life. You know what that looks like? Go to the local funeral home and you'll see. Death is life without stress. As long as you're breathing, you will encounter stress. So the issue is not whether or not there's stress, but whether stress turns into one of two things, distress or what's called eustress. Distress is toxic. Eustress is what psychologists term as transformative. It transforms you. Now, let's unpack that a little bit. Uh, distress, it leads to toxic attitudes. It leads to negative perspectives. The glass is always half full. I'm always last in line. Everyone's against me. I have the worst luck in the world. You see where I'm going here? This is distress talking. And it often is not only a mental and emotional thing, it comes out in physical ways. Uh, Your health is affected by this kind of ongoing distress or negative stress. You have this nerve that goes from, we all do, uh, from our brains down to the adrenal glands over our kidneys. And whenever we encounter unhealthy stress, it releases what's called cortisol. Cortisol is the most primitive thing in us that gets us to uh, back, you know, the days when we were cavemen and women. The fight or flight syndrome, I mean, it pumps us that you get energy and you're either going to fight that saber-toothed tiger or you're going to run. Problem is, we don't have saber-toothed tigers anymore. And so we get hijacked by much lesser stressors, but with the same cortisol kind of flow through our bodies. And when that happens in an ongoing, unmanaged way, it deteriorates your health. This is a proven issue. So that's distress. Now, eustress is transformative. Think of eustress as like a you're learning a new instrument, you're in the band, or you're learning uh, uh, some technology, some new technology that can turn to distress. Um, you, you have a challenging work project, you're working out and uh, really stressing your muscles and challenging them. You have a new spiritual practice. Maybe you're meditating, maybe you're journaling, maybe you're reading scripture daily, uh, and that's a new challenge for you. Maybe you're learning a new language or a new hobby. Those are the, those are the good kinds of stress that can enrich us and grow us. The problem is we often let distress, the bad kind of stress, hijack our emotions and hijack our bodies. I'll never forget the first time I learned this. I was in seminary. I went to Princeton Theological Seminary, which, you know, little snooty. It prides itself on being kind of the Ivy League of the seminaries. And so as there's a picture of Princeton Seminary here, uh, right next to Princeton University. And as such, whenever final exams would come at the end of the semester, I would get really nervous. I start feeling it in my stomach. And I had this, I started developing this eyelid twitch. And it felt like I was blinking like crazy. No one else could really notice it, but it felt like it to me. I'm like, oh my goodness. And I'd talk to my neighbor across the street, who's a fellow student. His name was Arturo. And uh, I called him Art, and Art would always say the same thing. Every time I would just complain and unload on him, he'd say, Tim, this too shall pass. <laughs> Which I both loved and hated at the same time when he said that. I'm like, yes, I know, but... <laughs> Interesting research has been done about the physical impact of stress. Uh, research has shown that women who suffered abuse are 60% more likely to have a child with autism. That is telling about the, the way that chemically, it affects us chemically in shaping the next generation physically and mentally. It's a scary thing. Chronic unmanaged stress impacts your immune system, your digestive system, uh, your uh, cardiovascular system, heart disease, hormones. It affects and promotes uh, depression and panic attacks. And how do we normally deal with stress? Negative stress, distress. We self-medicate, don't we? Uh, either excessive drinking or uh, abuse of drugs, sometimes even prescription drugs. We, you know, a lot of men especially turn to pornography. 
And that's a reality. It becomes kind of a, an outlet for your stress. Uh, a lot of people would turn to overeating to try to fill that void and it just makes you feel good and or the other extreme is excessive dieting just kind of trying to release that stress in a way that may not be the healthiest for you a lot of people do something that they don't even realize they're doing in order to deal with their stress and that is workaholism working and working and working sometimes way too much and it impacts your health it impacts your relationships or the other extreme from that is pulling the sheets over your head and you don't even want to get out of bed <laughs> you know just don't want to deal with it we see a lot of people dealing with their s negative stress with rage don't we especially on the roadways we call it road rage or people that we don't see walk into the threshold of their homes and they unload on the very ones they love and they don't want to. And so where's this coming from? It's coming from a place that has not been paid attention to. And so they start unloading their rage on a spouse or a child. We see a lot of people stonewalling. That's the other side of that, right? Just cutting people off. Just not dealing with reality. And a whole lot of people just seek distractions. TV becomes an easy one. Just turn on the boob tube and check out. Or social media is a big one and just people can spend hours on social media all this stuff has a negative net effect on your emotions on your relationships and even on your body a very interesting study was done in, Nor in Norway uh, about Facebook and about the media uh, social media use of, 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 of our social media they developed what was called the burger Facebook addiction scale the burger Facebook addiction scale to measure the effects of, uh, of our immersion into social media. And this is what they found. The more social media circles that you're a part of, the more different ones you're using and circles you're a part of, the more stress is associated with your life. Negative stress. They also found this, the greater social media use, and this is just alarming, sort of think of this, is associated with higher BMI, that is body mass index, binge eating, lower credit scores, and higher credit card debt. You know what all that adds up to? Distress. Distress. And, and, and that affects all kinds of relationships and networks in your life. Think about that. Listen, here's what all this bad news I'm painting is leading to. God didn't design us to live that way. It is not God's will that we live under that kind of stress, but rather that we are resilient. That it is not God's will that we are controlled by outer circumstances or by inner voices, by thoughts or feelings that tend to take us captive. God designed you so that no thought or feeling should take control of you or stress you out. God designed you to be resilient in stress. So the Apostle Paul he gives us some advice in this way, and this is what he says. This is how he's getting at how to handle this. In Philippians chapter 4, he says, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. In other words, we fill our minds, we fill our lives with so much negativity. There's so much C-R-A-P out there. We're all big boys and girls. I can say it. There's so much crap out there, right? And God is saying, don't do that to yourself. Be decisive. Be intentional about what you're exposing yourself to. And expose yourself to the good stuff, the stuff that's glorifying, that's dignity giving and honoring of human beings. Whatever you have learned, he says, or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Paul is lifting himself up as a physical example. He's saying, listen, I may be a little bit further down the road in doing this, so watch me, think like me, act like me, put it into practice. In other words, we need one another. You ever feel like you're all alone, like the song we just sang not long ago? No, you don't need to feel that way. Because not only is God with you, God's people are with you, and we need to be intentional about connecting with others in that way. So Paul is doing this. He reminds you to take control of stress by influencing your thoughts with three different things. Take control, control with, uh, you can stroll also. Uh, take control with these three different ideas. One is to, uh, with regard to what you watch and what you read. 
what you watch and what you read. Don't be haphazard with that. Be intentional. Don't live life by default. Live it by design. And let God direct you in the path of, uh, of what's purifying and godly. And secondly, what you listen to or follow. Who do you listen to? Who do you follow? Have you ever had a mentor in your life? I think one of the things that I've always tried to think about for me personally in my growth is, is people who can model for me or who have modeled and being very intentional about selecting them. Uh, there's a couple in Tampa, Florida. I lived in Tampa, Florida. And, uh, and, and they were, for me, the first people that I identified like, you really are good with your kids. I want to learn how to parent like you. And I watched them and I even told them, you know, um, I want you to kind of mentor me in this whole idea. Others who represent that for how to be a good husband, how to be a good brother, a friend, a pastor. And I've been very intentional about selecting mentors. And I think that's that's what Paul is saying here. He wanted to be that for the Philippians and we need that with one another. Do you do that for yourself? This is some advice that he's giving. And then thirdly, you can influence your thoughts uh, by thinking about to whom you are accountable. Who do you put yourself accountable? Now, obviously you choose who that is, someone who's trustworthy, someone for whom it's safe for you emotionally, but someone who can kind of enter into your world at your invitation and give you feedback. And we'll talk about that more. If you've ever, if you've ever had counseling, if you've ever had a Stephen minister, we talk about Stephen ministers at the end of our services, incredible opportunities or a friend or a mentor. Incredible opportunities for us to work through our stuff with someone else's aid. This is how God works. It's not just, I wish I could tell you, put the Bible under your pillow and by osmosis you'll be great tomorrow morning, but that won't happen. God designed us to do this with one another. Listen, here's the saying that's really helpful, I think. You either talk it out or you'll act it out. Whatever those stressors are in your life, if you're not working through it and processing it with someone else in a healthy way, you will act it out. It'll either be acted out in your physical well-being or in your relationships, guaranteed. Talk it out or you will act it out. Those are the two choices, right? Jesus, he comes along, of course, and he's saying you have options, guys. You don't have an option about living with stress. Stress is a fact of life. But you do have an option to live a worry-free life, despite the stressors in your life. That's the, you can be resilient in your stress. And so he shares this teaching from Matthew chapter 6. You've heard this before. He says, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food in the body, more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, all of his splendor, was dressed like one of these. So if, if that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after these things and your heavenly father knows what, that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. And can I get an amen? amen. Yeah, Jesus knows what life is like for us, doesn't he? And he uses this word for worry. It's a Greek word. It's the original language that he uses here that the that New Testament's written in. The word is marimna. Marimna means to anxiously worry. Not just to worry, but it's this kind of hand-rending worry. It's being possessed and controlled by whatever the stress is that's going on in your life. He's saying you don't need to live like that. You don't need to live like that. Focusing on worry leads to needless distress. Trust in God's care leads to the life that God intended you to live. There's more, Jesus is saying. There's better. There's better. And he emphasizes focusing on today. Focusing on today. Why? Because your future, your tomorrow is safe in God's hands. We know that. 
knowing that God has your tomorrow releases your anxiety about today. That's how it works. We know this. There's a great saying that kind of goes along with, with this idea. The person who possesses the last hour need not be anxious about the next moment. Isn't that good? You might want to write that down. Because we know that the end of the story is sure and certain and clear to us. That in the end, God will make all things new. All things will, will be restored and redeemed. Eden will be back to its original state. There will be no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears, no more, pain, no more death, no more endings, no more goodbyes, no more sin, no more heartache. God has our future in his hands. He has our last hour and he shares that with us so that we might be able to face the moment before us in a transformed way. And so Jesus breaks it down into two things. He's always doing this, sort of his little nutshell. He tells us two ways to cultivate trust in God like this. Very simply, here they are. Seek the kingdom of God and seek God's righteousness. Seek the kingdom of God, that's our goal. And seeking God's righteousness is the way to our goal. The way to our goal. In other words, he's saying focus on today. But let your living in the moment have an eternal purpose. That's the beauty. That's the beauty. Now, what Jesus is doing as he tells us this, Listen to this. He's giving you and me a stop doing list. You all probably have a to-do list hanging on your refrigerator under a magnet right now, don't you? You got to go to the grocery store. You got to get this. You got to get the car, oil change, so on and so forth. Jesus is actually giving you and me a stop doing list. And here it is. To seek the kingdom of God, he's saying, get off the throne. Dethrone yourself. Get out of yourself and let me be king of your life. See yourself, see your issues, see your life in the bigger perspective of my kingdom. And let me be in charge because guess what? I do a better job of it than you do. So just stop trying to control your life. Let me be the one. That's the first part of the stop doing list. The second part is to seek God's righteousness is to stop trusting your own self-righteousness or your self-rightness thinking that you have to prove yourself to God or to other people. You don't. That's why Jesus came. That's what the cross is about. He gives you as a gift his rightness, makes you right with God by his works, not by yours. You can add nothing to it or take, you can't take anything away from it by how you sin. You can't add anything to it by how good you are. That's called grace. And this is your stop doing list. And I hope that you're going, Phew. thank you, Jesus. Because this is what makes the difference in our lives. Linda Beale is one of our members, and uh, she has a little testimony that we want to share with you where she talks about how this has been worked out in her life. She and her husband, Greg, are new to our church, and uh, they were kind enough to stop in, and she responded on video and I want to share this with you now this is Linda Beal from the 10 o'clock service my name is Linda Beal my husband Greg and I attend the 10 o'clock service each Sunday this is our second winter here in Hope Sound we started looking for a church last year but just could not fit, find one that um, were our same beliefs we started coming here in November of 2015 and found that this was exactly the type of church that we wanted. We were looking for a community of faith that shared God's Word and that loved the Lord and that the pastor preached sermons that we could use in our daily life. For much of my Christian life, it's always been about following the rule book. As long as I did what the rule said, I was okay. I was raised by two parents who I know loved me, but they were very much perfectionist, and they, we attended a church that was legalistic. Therefore, I became a perfect legalist. As long as I followed the rules, I was good. However, that type of Christianity left me empty, discouraged and very much a perfectionist. 
It was not about a relationship with Christ, but about performing for Him and everyone else. It wasn't until about 10 or 12 years ago that I realized that God loves me because He created me, not because of what I do for Him. I still struggle many times with this, and it is a work in progress. Um, and that you can ask my husband about. The performing is still, uh, and being a perfectionist. Our first visit, visit to the church was the 8 o'clock service, and we really enjoyed it. But Pastor Tim said something about a choir singing in the 10 o'clock service, and we decided that that's where we needed to make a visit, because we both sing in the choir up in our home church in Pennsylvania. In December, I asked Esther uh, if we could possibly join choir, and she enthusiastically said, please come. So in January, we came, and on our first visit, the choir made us so welcome, and so did Esther, and we really enjoy being part of the choir. When we got into the car after that Sunday morning, we looked at each other and we said, I think we found our church. And we really did. Pastor Sim, Tim's sermons do not just fill a time slot each Sunday morning, but they are encouraging, inspiring, but very challenging. We as a church body are extremely the best to have a pastor who loves the Lord and models that, but has a desire to lead each of us into a life-changing walk with Christ. In January, we started the Wednesday night Bible study. This one has been very hard. Looking at your past and the good and the bad and then dealing with it and moving on to become emotionally, spiritually healthy. But as followers of Christ, we need to do this. This summer, we will be trying to sell our Pennsylvania home. In learning to know many of you, we know you've been there and done that. So we appreciate your prayers as we start that process. Thank you for making us a part of your faith community. Isn't that awesome, guys? And you know what Linda is doing for us? She's doing for us the same thing Paul was doing the Philippian church. She's showing us how the grace of Jesus replaces the stress of legalism. And it's an ongoing process, as she said, but this is the opportunity. And this is what we're about at Stuart Congregational Church. Have no doubts. We are peddlers of grace. That's what we're about. When you support the ministries of our church, we're seeking that kind of Christ-like transformation in all of our lives and to share that with our community and with our world. That's what we're about. And if you liked her story, uh, I mentioned earlier the mailing that's going out this Wednesday. We put together what are called people profiles and it's a little, a little brochure that has more stories of more people in the church. And it's amazing to see this and to celebrate this. This is what we're about here. And this is what all of our support is, is, is about. As we come together, as we give our tithes and offerings, as we give our time, as we build community together. Uh, so this mailing will be going out this week. If we don't have your address, please give us your address so you can get this. And I remind you too that we, we sent out a, a mailing a couple weeks ago, our stewardship mailing. This is just by way of communicating and make, being transparent so that you know everything that's going on in the life of our church and all of our financial plans for the year and, and, and where we see the Lord uh, bringing us. And uh, we, 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 as you know, uh, perhaps you heard, we have sort of a $3.20 a month challenge for everyone. That comes down to 80 cents a week. If everyone gives what they gave last year plus 80 cents a week or a Snickers bar, it's the Snickers bar challenge, uh, we will have a flawless budget year. And so we wanna remove all the hurdles. And next week what we're doing is we're gonna bring all of our commitment cards and those commitment cards were in that mailing that went out. And we're gonna place them on the communion table and it's consecration Sunday. And we're gonna consecrate them to the Lord. And we're gonna seek God's blessing so that we're good stewards of the resources that we bring together so that we can advance the cause of the kingdom and the gospel of hope and peace and grace for others. Next Sunday is gonna be an exciting Sunday because not only is it Consecration Sunday, but we're gonna have new members joining the church at both the 10 o'clock and at, the, uh, at this service. And two of them are adult baptisms, but they don't wanna be baptized uh, by our 
our sprinkling font. So we're going to go out to Bathtub Beach next Sunday, and you're invited. Bring your bathing suit. You can even wear your bathing suit to worship. Uh, we're, at one o'clock, we're going to meet at Bathtub Beach, and we're going to do full immersion baptisms out there. It's going to be a great day to celebrate what God is doing at Stewart Congregational Church, and I'm so excited about it. So we, we commit our, su- our support to Stewart Congregational to give voice to what Linda is sharing, how God is transforming her life and all of our lives. We, we give our support to our church because it gives voice to the promises of Scripture that again and again echo words of hope. Isaiah says this in his 26th chapter. You will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because they trust in you. Trust in the Lord forever. For the Lord, the Lord himself is the rock eternal. You see these themes again. Trust in God. He's worthy of your trust. You can trust in him. He will give you peace. Jesus said it, didn't he? My peace I give to you. I won't give to you like the world gives. You can't find this anywhere else, he's saying. You go to Matthew chapter 11 and he says this. Come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Doesn't that sound good? For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The yoke, the yoke was the, the rabbi's teaching, and he's, he's contrasting himself with all the other rabbis of his day who said, you've got you to go through all these hoops. You've got to jump these hoops and jump over these bars in order to be accepted by God. And he's saying, no, 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 no. It doesn't work like that. No. Let's do a trade-off. You give me what you think you need to do, and I'll give you my list. My list is a lot shorter. And I can do this better than you, he's saying. Let me be in charge. And Jesus didn't just teach about it. And this is what I love about the gospel stories. Jesus modeled this for us. He even modeled it through taking a cat nap. Remember the story of Jesus on the Sea of Galilee? He's out there with his disciples. They're in a boat. There are a few other boats on the lake. And a storm, a gale blows in. Waves are crashing into the boat. It's being swamped. They're trying to kind of, you know, the bucket brigade. They're freaking out. They look over and what's Jesus doing? He's asleep. He's asleep. And this is the way Mark records it in chapter 4. He says this. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was clearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? I mean, they're really beside themselves. And it says, He got up and rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And they were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? That even the wind and the waves obey him. Good question, huh? It's like an object lesson. By taking a nap, listen to this, by taking a nap, Jesus is illustrating to them and to you and to me what is possible in the midst of life's storms and the stress of life. Without even saying anything, without even being awake, he's showing us the possibilities. That's the opportunity. The gospel of peace, stress resilience because of what he brings to us. The gospel of Jesus offers you peace amidst tension. It offers you grace amidst burdens, calm in the storm. It offers you resilience in your stress, emotional maturity, and spiritual growth. This is the gospel. How do you get there? Well, I'm going to give you five steps, five things you can do. And I want to start with a very short story to kind of introduce these five things. And it really is about taking baby steps. But here's the story. It's set in a very picturesque village in Europe. A a lot of history in this town. Some tourists are walking around. They're in awe thinking there must be some amazing stories about people, famous people, great people. And they see an old timer who's a local. They approach him. They ask him, sir, are you a local? Yes. Yes. Well, can you tell us, were any great men born here? To which this old-time local replies, Nope, only babies. <laughs> You're not born into greatness, guys. We have to take baby steps. We have to take it from where we are. To be stress-resilient and to live in Jesus' peace, 
I want to suggest these five baby steps, okay? Here they are. You can write these down. The first one is this, and this may be the hardest of all. Slow down to feel. We run our lives at mock speed. And if someone were to ask you how you're feeling or how you're doing, what's the pat response? Yeah, good, fine, I'm well, I'm okay. We don't even know ourselves well enough to be able to articulate it to anyone else. Slow down in order to feel. Because you'll never know what's really going on inside you unless you slow down and cool the jets a little bit. Uh, Bob Burns wrote a book called Resilient Ministry, and he talks about these different things uh, that I'm giving you. I want to share with you what he says. He says, slowing down is being aware of what is going on inside of you and being able to name those things. Listen to this. Not when you're on the verge of collapse, but as you're moving along. You see, that's what happens to us. We run, 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 and then our world falls apart, and then we go, what happened? I don't get it. And then we're reaching out for help when we need to be slower in our pace and more introspective along the way. Slow down. And one of the things you do, once you slow down and begin to identify your feelings, is you write them down, which leads to the second baby step. Journaling. I've talked about this for the last couple of weeks. Why? Because you're taking what's internal and you're externalizing it, which means you can objectify it. You can see it outside of yourself. That is a therapeutic step in and of itself. Burns says this about journaling. It's a way of processing hopes and fears and longings and angers and prayers, the prayers of our hearts. And listen to this. It can be a place we sound off before God so we don't sound off in inappropriate ways with others. I mean, Christians need to hear this as much as anybody else. Prayer through journaling is a way of processing those feelings so that we don't put our foots in our mouths and hurt others and have regrets that are avoidable. So slow down to feel Journal, externalize those feelings. And then you can do the third thing, which is identify your emotions. Begin to put words to them and begin to identify them. We're so, so bad at doing that. Um, Burns says this about identifying your emotions, neither to suppress your feelings nor to vent them, but simply to reflect, to be self-reflective. And this is where Jesus is leading us. This is what he did. This is how he prayed when he drew aside from the crowds and the pressures and the stress around him. And that leads to the fourth one, which is to get feedback. This is where you take it beyond yourself into relationships with others. You're seeking a mentor. You're seeking a counselor. You're seeking a trusted friend. You're entering into a Stephen ministry relationship. You're seeking out someone who can speak to you about yourself and getting perspective on yourself. He says this, unless we're working very hard to control our nonverbal cues, we're often unaware of them. Unless we receive feedback from others, we'll be unaware of what we are communicating and we'll fail to understand the emotions behind our silent messages. Listen, I have people that sit across my desk all the time and there's one message coming out of their mouth and there's a whole nother message on their body and on their facial expressions and they're not even aware of it. And that's sad. There's conflict going on. There are mixed messages. What does that do to relationships? Sabotages them. And so this is about starting with yourself, looking inward, and then taking it outward and getting feedback. And that leads to the fifth thing, and that is sail with Jesus. Invite Jesus along. Ask Jesus to do with the storms of your life what he did with the storms in the gospel on the Sea of Galilee. Quiet. Be still. Let him speak to him. Invite him into the storms. Act like him. Think like him. Focus on him. Enter into God's kingdom. Dethrone yourself. Leave your kingdom behind. Trust his power. Trust his grace. And remember that because of Jesus, you possess the last hour. And therefore, You need not be anxious about the next moment. Amen?